Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this Grant Thornton uh, virtual event to discuss carbon pricing uh, and carbon taxes. Uh, we're delighted to be um, broadcasting to you this morning from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research um, in London. Um, I've got three uh, industry experts with me today to talk about uh, the topic and individual areas uh, therein. Um, they are Dawn Holland, a macroeconomist from the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, uh, Dan Dickinson, who's a partner uh, in tax at uh, Grant Thornton, and finally, uh, Phil Mitchell, who's a consultant at Carbon uh, Intelligence. Um, just some quick housekeeping before we, uh, we begin. Um, if you could have your mics off um, at all times, please, that's very helpful for us. Uh, Q&A um, will be in the chat function um, on the, uh, the application that you're viewing um, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, the event is recorded. Um, so it'll be available for you to return to, and the slides are available um, after the event. So let me, without further ado, uh, Dawn, would you mind taking it away? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Andy. Um, so I thought I would kick off by uh, giving you a bit of a background into how MISO fits into the whole world of climate pr uh, carbon pricing, climate modelling, etc. So NISA started building its uh, climate model in 20, uh, 2018. So it's relatively new to the game, um, but it's developing this climate module into uh, NISA's long-standing global macroeconomic model, which we call NIGEM. And NIGEM is, has been in use for over 30 years now. Um, it's widely used in central banks, finance ministries, and other private and public sector bodies around the world. Um, and the main aim of our climate model is to be able to analyze the macroeconomic implications of climate risks. So we use the uh, NIGEM climate model in-house here at NISA, but it's also used, it's also been used by, for example, Bank of England, Bank of France, um, Dutch National Bank for, as part of their stress testing exercises. And this year, 2021, Nisa joined the NGFS, that's the Network for Greening the Financial System. So it's a network of central banks and financial supervisors from around the world um, who are concerned about climate risks. Um, and are, uh, we joined to help develop the, uh, their long-term climate scenarios, which are, used, which are um, a sort of a common framework that's being adopted by the central banks and, and supervisors um, to, uh, it, as part of their um, their understanding of climate risks. Um, we often work with other bodies, the UN Environment Program, um, where we're mo more looking at sort of short-term climate sh policy shocks and their implications, and partnering with some other organizations to both develop the model and apply it um, further. Um, so what are the types of uh, things, we're, questions that we're asking? So I mean, I think, um, we all know that one of the key challenges that we face in trying to understand uh, climate risks is the enormity of the uncertainties, right? So the temperature pathways are uncertain. The climate reactions to temperature pathways are uncertain. The policy uh, pathways to support the transition are uncertain. The reaction of individuals to the policies, you know, what does the central bank do? Um, who, is there a carbon revenue? Who spends it? And, um, and on what um, all of these things are are uh, are open to open to debate, and so rather than so that's why we develop a sort of scenario approach so that we can look at the macroeconomic implications of some of these areas of uncertainty. Um, the types of climate scenarios we look at. So we've got we so we divide them into sort of physical shocks, policy shocks, and then other types of shocks. So on the physical side, you have acute, uh, acute climate related shocks. So that's like um, weather related shocks. So floods, storms, uh, droughts, things that are going to happen suddenly. These are particularly interesting for insurers, for example. And then we also have what we call chronic uh, physical shocks. So that's essentially the global, the sort of gradual erosion of productive capacity associated with rising temperatures, you know, rising sea levels, um, impact on labor productivity and those sorts of issues. Climate policy shocks, so that's what we're mainly focusing on today. So we'll cut to the chase. Um, uh, that's carbon pricing, basically carbon 
and you know, the things that the policies that go along along with it, like border carbon adjustments. And then there's other types of shocks like you know, spikes or collapses in commodity prices like oil prices, asset stranding, and uh, issues related to uh, risk premium, uh, which I'll say a bit more about. Um, so just back to basics. Why, why price carbon? Okay, so very, fairly straightforward. Um, relative prices matter. So if uh, when you introduce a price on carbon, it raises the cost of uh, carbon, high, heavy carbon emitting activities relative to low carbon emitting activities. And that impacts our choices. So it impacts our choice of production technologies. It impacts the choices that consumers make in terms of the uh, goods and services that they, that they choose to consume. So the, the, the basic point of the carbon uh, price is to shift behavior um, in order to guide uh, the economy towards a lower carbon trajectory. Um, if you want to look at it in terms of sort of economic speak, you can talk about um, uh, the externality and market distortion caused by sort of free riding on, on, uh, on emissions. So we know that greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions um, have a uh, very um, serious environmental costs, which society bears. Um, we are all exposed to the the, um, the, the, the looming crisis and, and in our in our planet. Um, but the individual emitters don't face that cost, um, and so that means that they they um, it doesn't form part of their sort of cost benefit analysis when they're um, choosing production um, technologies and or choosing the consumption goods that they, that they um, which. So the carbon price acts as a sort of, uh, to, uh, to partially remove some of this, this, uh, this market distortion. Um, so, okay, so we, once we introduce a carbon price, what's the sort of macroeconomic implications? Now this is obviously very complex, but I've tried to sort of break it down into sort of three sort of core channels to think about. And I'll start with the bottom one, which is uh, you introduce a carbon price. First thing that happens is that the cost of production increase. Uh, very simple, right? Um, and so what, what does that mean? So that means, well, part of that is going to mean that um, consumer prices go up. So we get higher inflation that constrains um, consumer spending. And part of that will act as a sort of squeeze on firm profits. Um, so that um, impacts their investment decisions. So investment would be expected to Time, accumulation of capital would be lower, and so potential output over the longer term would be expected to be lower. And at the firm level, we see balance sheet adjustments and also adjustments to financial institutions that support those firms. And that's quite important. I'll say one more word about that in a minute. Um, the other um, second channel is that when we uh, raise the so we raise the costs of burning fossil fuels. So we expect to see the demand for fossil fuels and the energy mix shift least gradually over time. Um, and as that demand, that uh, the, the mix of energy um, uh, shifts, we see a decline in demand for fossil fuels at the global level. Um, that means that the price, the global sort of pre-carbon price tax, the pre-carbon price um, fossil fuel cost. Um, is also expected to go down. And so the impact of that um, it depends very much on whether uh, a country is a fossil fuel exporter or importer. So exporters suffer some, uh, can suffer some significant terms of trade losses, whereas importers will benefit from lower import costs. And so that can partially offset the inflationary impact of the carbon tax. Okay, so those are the those are two key channels. The third one in the middle is that there's potential um, for a carbon price to generate fiscal revenue, and that depends on how the policy is designed. But if it is designed in a way that does generate re revenue, that can improve the government budget balance, create some fiscal space, which can then be used in a variety of ways, you know, reducing debt or spending on uh, on high priority programs. So I want to just say one more word about the balance sheet implications. Um, so uh, carbon price um, will 
um, mean that assets related to high emitting activities um, may, uh, some activities will, will no longer be viable, but straight on that. Um, whereas some low carbon activities may become more profitable over time. So we expect to see some shakeup in valuations. Um, so the question is then, um, do we know who holds which assets and are these carbon risks fully priced? And I think if we ask that question today, um, the answer is almost definitely no, um, which is why our sort of financial supervisors are sort of um, uh, scrambling to you know, come up with a methodology for firms to, to sort of do firm level stress testing so that we don't find ourselves um, facing a financial crisis as, um, as uh, emission um, reduction activities um, intensify over, over the future, which we know that they will. Um, so how about the magnitudes? Um, let's talk about magnitudes. So um, how would a rise in the carbon price impact inflation and GDP, our two headline indicators? Um, so I've just shown a, a simple illustration here. Of, so what if uh, tomorrow uh, the carbon price around the world jumped up by $100 per ton of CO2? This is a hypothetical scenario. Um, that's a big jump. It's a big jump relative to where prices are now. Um, and and um, we would suggest that that's, that would have a significant but um, uh, short-term impact on the inflation rate. Um, in Europe and Japan, we would expect inflation um, in response to that to, to rise by about one and a half percent. And with slightly higher um, impacts in, um, in the US, which is more energy intensive, more carbon intensive economy. Impacts on GDP would also be um, uh, significant with declines in GDP growth of somewhere between 0.7, 1.2 percentage points for a couple of years um, as the transition progresses. So these are, these are non-trivial impacts. Now, this is assuming that there um, uh, is no major shakeup in the financial uh, system, but what if uh, what if there, um, the, the sudden adjustment um, leaves, you know, is unexpected um, and so leaves some firms with stranded assets and we discover that actually the, uh, the risks of, of this were not fully priced into, into the valuations. This could lead, lead to a se um, severe shakeup. Um, a rise in risk premia. We think of it along the same lines as the global financial crisis. So here I've just shown an illustration of, you know, if, if the, the, the um, uh, financial system uh, impacts were about one third of the size of, the, of what we saw in the global financial crisis, we can see, you know, uh, investments falling by about 5% world trade contracting by about one and a half percent. So that's um, that's calibrated to about a third of the size of the client, uh, financial crisis. It could be even bigger. Um, so uh, so that I think is the key area where um, where where we see that this, some of the, the greatest uh, risks. Um, and my final comment um, so um, is on so carbon price versus carbon tax. So there is a car so there's carbon prices already prevailing across Europe with the emissions trading system. Um, uh, some countries in Europe, like Germany, and I think Austria has just introduced um, and Ireland a uh, uh, carbon tax as well on top of that. What is what's the difference between the two and what are the implications? Um, anyway, the, 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 um, in terms of uh, changing behaviors, it's, it's quite similar. In terms of the sort of inflationary impacts, probably quite similar as well. One of the key differences is, you know, who gets the revenue? Is there revenue? Um, uh, so um, if we have a carbon tax that generates fiscal revenue, which goes to the government, and then the government can then decide how to, what to do with that, that revenue. Um, and this chart here is just to show that this, um, the, the, fiscal, um, uh, the, the fiscal reaction makes a big difference in terms of the macroeconomic picture. So we show here two, uh, this, this is based on the, one of the NGFS scenarios, the net zero by 2050 
uh, scenario. And we look at two options. One, when we have 100% of uh, the carbon price is treated as a tax, where all of that revenue is channeled into productive investment. So it could be in terms of investing in renewables or investing um, in energy efficiency gains, etc. Um, and then the second scenario where there's no revenue that goes, um, uh, no revenue uh, recycling back into the economy. And you can see the swing between the two is about five percentage points. So it does have a quite a significant um, impact how policy is designed, whether it generates um, revenue and um, how that revenue is then spent. So thank you very much. I will stop there um, and look forward to hearing what our other have to say. Thank you, John. That was a fantastic uh, introduction, uh, sort of macro perspective, um, for sure. Uh, Dan, you're joining us remotely from, from Leeds. Um, if, you can, if you can hear me, um, perhaps you could provide your, uh, your comments from a, from a tax perspective. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy and, and Don. And thumbs up if you can hear me okay. Good. Yeah, thank you. I'm suffering from a bit of a cold. I, I normally sound much more silky than this, honestly, but uh, but thanks. And th thanks for having me. As, as Andy said, I'm a, I'm a tax partner. I focus on international tax, so multinationals. So um, clearly this is one of the most international things you could, you could ever be talking about, really. Um, the, the GT session was headlined as, uh, as carbon audit and tax. Um, they're both individually really big topics. You know, and, and I know Philip's going to come on a bit to talk about the regulatory environment, assurance and things like that. So I, I, I won't major on it. I'll, I'll major on tax. But just, just the, the, the perspective I've been getting from my audit and assurance colleagues who, who, who work in this area is, is really that reporting information on, on, on ESG in general and, and the E in it, you know, was what we're talking about today, is currently, you know, inherently risky in, in their view. Um, reporting in those areas, reviewing those reports. It's not like financial information. There's no, there's no double entry. There's no automatic checks and balances on, on accuracy. And there's rarely at the moment, the same controls as you would see regarding financial information. You know, the controls, the controls environment is starting to change in the bigger organizations, but, but many around the world um, don't have the same levels of controls around this as they do around, around finance. So, so if you as a, as a financial services organization are looking to use this reporting for decision-making, you know, around lending, investing, or, or insuring, just be very careful and, and challenge hard. And don't forget about the G in ESG, the governance, you know, really test your customers' processes to, to understand how serious they are about this. Um, so moving just on to the main, the main part of what I'm gonna say around the, the, the current UK and global environment around, around carbon policy and, and, and taxes. You know, as, as I said, you've already had a really interesting um, introductory session from Dawn around carbon pricing, which historically has been one of the main policy tools that governments have used to try and reduce emissions. Um, you've seen, you know, it, it, unless you live under a rock, you know, you've seen how currently the supply issues, the, the raft of decarbonisation announcements of governments have pushed those carbon prices to record highs. Increasingly, though, governments are turning to other tools, which we can broadly lump together and call carbon taxes, um, in order to, to both stimulate um, behavioural change and, and to raise revenue, as Dawn was talking about. Uh, as of today, there's something like 50 countries in the world that have got a, a particular carbon tax initiative, um, and I can see that that's only going to grow. Um, you know, Dawn touched on the kind of the economic and policy attractiveness of carbon taxes you know the, the graph she put up on the on her, on her last slide shows why governments would be attracted to it um you know the, the world bank reported that, that over 50 percent of paris agreement signatories are considering carbon taxes at the moment now on the current tax base around the world there's, there's estimates i've seen that that say those taxes only cover around 25 percent of all greenhouse gases at the moment so that's another way you can see that, um, that, that, that there's plenty of scope to, to, to do more in that area if governments choose. Um, there's no science behind what I'm going to say next, uh, you know, I hasten to add. But that, that figure isn't a million miles off the level of greenhouse gases from scope one and two emissions in the estimates I've seen. Um, and, and, and that makes sense to me because most of the carbon taxes around the world at the moment focus on scope one and a bit of scope two because that's easier. Um, scope three is much harder, but there's, there's a lot more to go at. Now, I think in the future, just my personal view, governments will start to look at taxation on, on scope three. And actually, um, some of the bigger organisations in the world are starting to, to, to think about that. So there was, a, there was an announcement recently from Unilever about how they're kind of pushing carbon reduction 
down their supply chain. If you have a look at their reporting around this, um, it, it focuses heavily on their on their scope three position. Um, so part of that will be because they may be anticipating uh, further taxes in, in this area. Um, the UK's position is evolving. Um, the, the UK government consulted about a broad, broader based carbon tax um, last year and uh, early this year, and then decided to stick with the emissions trading system and things like the climate change levy for now. It'd be interesting to see if anything moves in this area in the UK. Um, you know, there's a budget coming up, we're hosting COP26. To me, it feels strange that, um, that, that we wouldn't put out at least, at least in more detail the, the roadmap in these areas. Yeah, there's been reports of a gas levy. Um, you know, I saw it on, on Sky News and in the Times, I think, some, some kind of leaks of thinking around that. That's focused on, on consumers rather than companies. The next thing we know that will be produced in the UK is uh, an updated report called the Cost of Net Zero, which the Treasury's promised to release before COP26. So hopefully we'll see that next week even. Um, but the key issue for, for, for all multinationals is consistency. The taxes all around the world are very different, different rates, different bases, different reporting requirements, and ultimately it's an extra cost in the supply chain that could be uncertain, um, you know, which is hard, especially for energy intensive businesses at the moment. COP26 is coming up. In an ideal world, you'd see some sort of global agreement on how to have consistent carbon taxation and carbon policies. That won't, that won't happen. History tells us that won't happen, especially around tax policy, where governments are very protective around their own policy, you know, for their own revenue protection and, and political reasons. I'm sure we'll see broad agreements on going faster on decarbonisation, which, which will make more governments, more governments then think about um, uh, using tax, carbon taxes as, as an extra lever to meet those new requirements. An inconsistency creates its own distortions. Uh, you know, Don talked a lot about externalities in the world. The, the tax policies themselves, when they're different, create other distortions. Countries and companies with less focus on, on decarbonisation have a short-term cost advantage over those that are focusing on it more. You know, Don mentioned carbon adjustment mechanisms, and that's exactly what the EU is thinking about for 2023. Um, details are scant at the moment, but things that they're thinking about could be additional levers like customs duties, excise taxes, or even trying to force third country importers to buy EU energy trading allowances. Again, more cost and complexity um, for, for multinationals to worry about and for you to worry about as, as financial institutions funding those, those entities. So what does all that mean for you as financial institutions? You know, starting with lending and, and asset management, one interesting summary I've read was produced by the, the Oliver Wyman organisation last year. Um, they sought to model the impacts of carbon taxes on two heavy carbon industries, being power and, and oil and gas, and then extrapolate that to all industries, kind of a transition risk test, you know, the, the likes of which Don was talking about. Their methodology reached the top end figure of credit losses of up to a trillion dollars globally, driven by a lack of climate change risk being factored into, you know, historic and current credit risk and loan pricing. Um, you know, it's a big number they're throwing around, um, but when you listen to Dawn's presentation as well, it doesn't, it doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel fanciful, does it? Um, payback on new investment has also come up often in my discussions with corporate climate clients and, and investment banks in particular. You know, our current financial models, you know, allowing you to make a decision on an investment fit for purpose and, and long term enough. What do your stakeholders know value in, 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 what you, in how you operate and what you're looking to invest in? So around tax, what can you ask of your customers and your portfolio? I know I'm showing it to Philip's area again a little bit, so I won't, I won't major on this, but as part of your assessments of credit risk and asset risk, you know, I'd be asking to see detailed evidence that your customers and investees have, have modelled in potential increase in taxes and therefore costs in their supply chains. You know, do they know the direction of travel and policy in their key jurisdictions? And, and, and importantly, these days in their suppliers, key jurisdictions as well. Do they monitor and update their own current and, and projected carbon emissions? Have they stress tested for potential new taxes? Yeah, whilst lending and asset management is directly exposed to carbon tax proliferation, you know, the insurance market will, in my mind, be focused on, on wider policies, you know, how to price in increasing and, and changing risks related to climate change and whether the government policies that will, will include carbon taxes um, will start to have an impact over time with reducing risks. Just to finish up, hopefully I haven't used the, the whole time quite yet. Um, the other side of the poli policy equation is just, just important to bear in mind as well, you know, as a financial institution looking at, looking at your customers, and that's around incentives. Um, you know, it's not all cost and risk and bad news. 
in total, there's something like 4,000 different incentives around the world, um, increasing da daily. You know, broadly, you can split these into reduce, switch, and innovate you know, with efforts around carbon in all of those buckets. Um, an example of the UK's approach in this area was the, the um, industrial decarbon decarbonisation strategy published in March this year, um, where, where the, U the UK government's focused on a, on a five-year plan um, a, a lot of which in the middle is around incentives to encourage to encourage change. Um, question I have really is, is it going to be enough? You know, when you think about the distortions and first mover disadvantages um, discussed earlier. But there's also inconsistencies and gaps within individual countries and when comparing jurisdictions in the in the incentive space as well. With the OECD's work on, on minimum taxation levels finally showing some agreement, um, actually, I can see incentives around climate change becoming even more of an area of competition between countries than they are at the moment. You know, just a couple of inconsistency examples. You know, within the UK, I had a recent client example um, that doesn't that doesn't really make sense to me. Where certain commercial property developers they can't claim enhanced R and D allowances in the UK uh, on greening buildings, and that's because they're not seen as trading businesses. You know that that's the sort of inconsistency that you would think a government would try and iron out when they were when they were um, focused in this area. Yeah, and then comparing countries around the world, some focus on first year allowances for green investment. Some offer greater incentives around sequestration if we're talking about carbon. Others offer enhanced R and D re reliefs and other and other tax breaks. It's a very mixed bag, um, and that's where uh, you as financial services organisations and, and me as a tax advisor can help. You can help work through all those inconsistencies. You know, I do think financial services organisations and organisations like GT can play a greater role in helping governments look at policy more, more holistically. Yeah, things like additional incentives through the tax system to invest in new technologies, like more targeted relief for interest costs on certain types of investments, more first year allowances, protecting carried interest, you know, where the green investments are being made, even changes around inheritance tax. I can see all of those things being, being helpful in stimulating change, um, especially around carbon reduction policies. Um, that's a very quick summary of a, of a complex picture, uh, especially when you think about it globally. You know, as a firm, we're having lots of conversations and working with lots of clients in this area, and we're, we're always happy to help you, you know, one-on-one -on -one or, or, or in a group situation. Um, for me, how we're helping is, you know, we've got specialists in any area that could come up in a, in a discussion around, around the E of ESG. I think what I'm really focusing on with my clients, you know, especially in the, the mid to upper mid market is, Let's step back and really focus on why, what you're trying to achieve, what are your targets, why, and, and how are you going to do it? And really have those discussions at a strategic level and then work out what specialists we need to bring in um, to cover the areas that are important to, to a particular client. Um, and then uh, my, my, my fellow partner, Harps, is going to join. I think he wanted to, to just finish off in, in that area on how we've been supporting, if he's on. I think we've got some communication difficulties actually connecting connecting him. So Dan, I'll take it uh, away from you. And um, so That's thank right. you very much for that for that summary. Uh, again, as you say, it's an incredibly uh, complex area, and certainly in this in this environment, we're seeking to give people some introduction and some guidance around what they need to be uh, considering with respect to carbon. It's uh, very very helpful uh, indeed. Phil, can I pass over to you for the last, the last slot uh, before we go to Q&A? We've got lots of Q&A coming in. So thank you very much uh, indeed for your engagement so far. Phil, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Phil Mitchell. I'm a consultant at Carbon Intelligence. I'm going to rattle through rather more slides than Dan just presented, um, talking about net zero in finance, uh, internalising carbon pricing and finally regulations, which I promise to keep brief. Um, just an introduction to Carbon Intelligence. We are a data and consultancy company based in London, 125 employees. Um, we, our heritage is in real estate, but now we, as you can see from this list of clients on the bottom, we cover all manner of sectors. And we uh, strongly believe in um, setting science-based targets of net zero. Um, we have set almost half of the UK's approved science-based targets. Uh, this is the framework that we uh, work with our clients quite a lot. It's approved by the World Business Council for sustainable development. And it takes businesses through these kind of six stages to really make sure it's properly embedded in their business when they're setting uh, emissions reductions targets. 
Now, what we haven't really heard today is what the cost of um, carbon taxes and, and carbon prices is likely to be in the future. And there's lots of estimates out there and clearly lots of uncertainty, but they're certain to go up. And our advice to real world companies, as well as in financial services, is generally try and cut your emissions as much as possible to help reduce this risk. Hence, this focus on net zero that I'm going to go through now. Um, I just thought I'd start with a, a basic uh, intro to uh, the various scopes of GHG emissions in case people aren't aware of that. I think my clickers stopped working. Here we are. Um, people who aren't familiar with this, um, you really just want to know that scope one and two is what's mostly closely associated with your um, emissions in your offices and in your factories. And then you've got an awful lot of scope three emissions to do with upstream and downstream suppliers. And the reason I, I flag this here is because financial services specifically have an awful lot of scope three exposure, that's loans and investments, also called financed emissions. And that's important when you're looking to set a net zero target, uh, because it's pretty difficult to measure that. So if we were setting a net zero target for a normal financial institution on the left here, you can see you'd look at your operational net zero, so your buildings, your um, commuter travel, etc. And um, that's fairly easy to do, but unfortunately only accounts for about 5% of your emissions. When we're looking at net zero for the portfolio, it's a far bigger chunk. And PCAF is helpful in uh, providing guidelines as to how you assess those carbon emissions, but it's still far from perfect. Uh, in terms of these net zero targets, I uh, just thought I'd clarify as well what that means. Science-based, um, and if the text you can't read, I apologize, but science-based really means it's in line with um, the science of one and a half degrees warming above uh, pre-industrial revolution times. Uh, net zero specifically means that you want to reduce your emissions to limiting warming to one and a half degrees and then um, also balance any remaining emissions. And the critical issue with both of these and why it's relevant to our discussion today is you should absolutely be minimizing the use of offsets in these targets. It's all about reducing your absolute emissions and then really as little as possible um, paying or investing for offsets. Um, if you are looking at offsets, by the way, um, you'll see a range of prices out there and there's huge differences in terms of quality of those offsets. Um, generally speaking, if they're costing less than $20 a ton, they're probably not really doing what they say. Um, but we could talk about that for a very long time. And in terms of these scope three rules, as I said, it's, it's definitely not a pure science at the moment and rules are still being set. What is happening is um, large groups of various parts of the financial services industry are coming together to help set guidelines. And you can see here a recent timeline. There's been a lot of big reports coming out this year. The Asset Owners Alliance, the um, Asset Managers Initiative, SBTI has come up with some updates as well, and even the Bankers Alliance. I think there's now an insurance body as well that's helping clarify the treatment of all these um, uh, methods for analyzing your scope three. Um, if you're looking at assets now, um, under this umbrella of the Glasgow Financial Alliance, you're talking well in excess of $50 trillion. I think it's over 20% of global GDP is now covered by these um, bodies. And although they very rarely specifically reference um, CO2 pricing or um, carbon offsets in their guidance, they, they will look at um, CO2 intensity as one of the key KPIs when you're looking at your um, portfolio emissions. Um, the, the main reason that, that the main way in which they hope to affect change and see real world reductions is through what we call alignment and engagement. And engagement is perhaps the most important now in terms of getting investors and um, people providing debt to these companies to actually engage with them and get these companies to also reduce their um, emissions. Um, and we get a lot of pushback, of course, from companies when you mention net zero. A lot of people don't really want to believe in it because, to be honest, if you look at the International Energy Agency and their forecast for net zero, they admit that almost half of the reduction is coming from technologies which don't yet exist. So clearly it's quite hard to put it in a, in a easily visible context. So it tends to be a focus on targets up to 2030 first and then hopefully extending that to 2050 when we have better visibility. We use this chart actually for a lot of real world companies rather than financial, but I think it's equally relevant. You build your business with resilience, you drive innovation, you prefer, you, you're, you're better prepared for any kind of policy shifts, your reputation generally improves, and that's both with your um, customers and with your employees, and you demonstrate leadership. And I've just put here that data is by far the biggest challenge that all of our financial services clients face. 
it's getting that data accurate around scope three to actually help them. But uh, generally, in that regard, it's about having some data which is better than no data at the moment. So the next um, topic I want to talk about was internalizing carbon pricing. And um, this is something which is far more advanced in the real world than in financial services at the moment. But I would also tie it into um, internal engagement generally. Um, the stats are very clear on this, and it's really you know, 101 of, of um, sustainability in businesses now, is you have to engage your employees. You have to have buy-in right from the top to the very bottom of your um, uh, employees. And you can see here some of the stats in terms of improved productivity, in, improved retention of talent. People, especially younger people these days, definitely want to work for organizations that do this properly. Um, and part of that engagement does come down to internal pricing of carbon. And I've just got three slides here to flag the benefits. Sadly, these companies are not all clients of ours. Um, and also very few of them are financial service companies. Um, we have started seeing financial service companies pay some sort of lip service to internal carbon pricing. And we have the likes of Swiss Re, which has actually been doing it for a while and recently increased its internal price, I think, from $10 to $100. Um, when it comes to operational um, pricing. But managing risk is obviously a big one, and especially when you're talking about insurers here, um, internalizing that perception of risk. Secondly, it's revealing opportunities. It helps um, clarify where you need to make investments and make improvements. And finally, as a transition tool. And um, I think Dan mentioned Unilever. Unilever is definitely one of the companies that is ahead of the game looking at this. Um, this is for people interested in kind of best practice for internal pricing as well. There is this business leadership criteria for carbon pricing, which you can um, sign up to. And you can see there's some, um, some direction as to how to best implement it and what you need to do to effectively try and get others to, to follow the lead. Finally, on regulations, I promise to keep this brief, um, and I will. And the regulations are not specific to carbon taxes or pricing. Um, I just wanted to flag two big elephants in the room coming really mostly next year for financial services. Um, first of these is EPA, SFRD and the EU taxonomy regulation. This is going to be, I mean, it's, elements of this have already come into force this year, and the, any asset managers listening will know that you need to start um, uh, labeling your funds as Article 6, 8, or 9, depending on what kind of um, climate effect they are aiming for. What the real breakthrough of this is actually going to be in terms of um, what's called CSRD, which is going to be getting real world companies to improve their disclosure. So, for next, from 2023, I believe, all companies with more than 250 employees and all listed companies are by law going to have to report on their emissions. And this is obviously going to massively improve the picture that um, financial institutions have in terms of their scope three, i.e. where they are investing, what those emissions are coming out from those investments. Uh, it's also going to be fascinating because the emphasis on this uh, legislation is very much to do with financing the transition. So, for example, if you're a company that has 100% of your revenues in, um, in, in uh, services that are considered doing harm to the environment, but you are transitioning your capex and your opex into areas that are not, then you will be considered a, you know, a taxonomy compliant um, company, which is, I think, going to be a massive incentive for investments to flow into these transitioning companies. Second one, uh, second bit of regulation coming down the pipe is TCFD. Um, this is going to. This is more about uh, reporting on how the climate is going to affect you. I think Dawn was talking about risks from carbon taxes, and I'm sure that is going to be part of the risks that need to be uh, dealt with as part of this reporting. And um, I'm sure a lot of you are already very familiar with this, so I won't go into any details, but um, it is taking in more um, companies over the next couple of years. And I have a little chart here with a timeline just to show you, and sorry about the formatting on this, but um, it's really um, from this year, it's mandatory for any pension schemes over five billion next year it's going to be even smaller pension schemes and all large uk listed companies and then from 2023 pretty much everyone is going to have to be tcfd reporting um very finally what's all this going to cost well i don't have an estimate for what the carbon price or taxing is going to cost but i do have some history of the 2008 financial crisis and what that meant in terms of compliance costs for reporting and i just thought i'd put this slide in to give you some Reminder, um, pre-2008, 
um, compliance costs were pretty, pretty tiny. This is an average per organization in euros million. 2009 bit seems to have dropped off in terms of the, the key, but it's gone up exponentially in the last 10 to 15 years. And I suspect this is going to be a very uh, significant part of compliance costs for most financial services going forward. So I just want to flag that as something that people need to be factoring into their budget. That's it. Thank you for finishing on that happy note. <laughs> uh, obviously, over, over and above the, the taxes themselves, clearly the costs are significant uh, and frankly unquantifiable, which is why this discussion uh, I think is so, uh, is so relevant. Uh, Phil, can I start with you? I'm just leading my chairman's prerogative and ask, and ask you a question of my own. Uh, are financial institutions using science-based targets in their, in their strategies and their execution? So there's definitely a lot more attention placed on them. Um, the Science-Based Target Initiative, for those that don't know, is, is a joint venture with the CDP and the World Resource Institute. And um, what makes it different to a normal net zero target is it's very um, tightly audited and approved. So it, it's independently approved. So it really is the gold standard of net zero. And unfortunately for a lot of financial service companies, that does make it much more of an intimidating project to go through. Um, you will see if you look at the SBTI website that I think there are something like 70 or 80 financial institutions that have signed up to do this and have not yet submitted their targets. So it's it's um, underway for a lot of organizations and that involves an awful lot of preparing your business to collate all that data and have it in a format that's acceptable to the SBTI. Um, so as I said, I think there's 70 that have officially done it given Anecdotally, the companies that we're talking to, I'd say there's at least double that who are considering it and wanting to think about factoring it in. And it's and it quite often comes the speed of, of adoption quite often comes down to the complexity of those finance conditions. So, for example, we're talking to a couple of insurers who actually have a fairly simple book of assets that is going to be quite easy to assess. You then have, of course, investment banks and uh, com complex private equity businesses that have just a mass of different assets, which makes it a far more complicated process. So I would absolutely say net zero and to an extent science-based targets are influencing strategy. And most financial institutions, quite rightly, are just wanting to take their time to make sure they're not accused of greenwashing and announcing something that they can't actually deliver in practice. And the, the, the science-based targets themselves, do you think they're going to become the benchmark? Do you think they'll be adopted more broadly by governments? Are they going to be used to you know, set the standard? Um, I mean, I'm a bit biased because our organisation thinks of them as, as the best standard. Um, I, they do get criticism from some other areas in terms of some of the kind of technical elements of the way that they... I, I think certainly the, the way in which they are designed is that the more the people that sign up, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, if you are a private equity company and all of your other um, portfolio companies have set a science-based target, that will make it much easier for you to set your own. So it, the more that join in, it becomes this um, beneficial kind of cycle. Um, so yeah, I, I hope so. And they are certainly in discussion with the likes of the Net Zero Asset Management Initiative to make sure that they iron out any differences in terms of the way that they assess the yeah. missions. Yeah. So, you know, they are generally trying to work together to make sure it's easier, even if you're not signing up to SBT. Yeah. Um, first question from the uh, from the audience, Dawn, is to you. So, how are financial institutions using your macro research uh, in the area of uh, climate change? Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, so, I guess I would highlight. Um, two key ways that they're being used. So um, first, you know, we, we produce these sort of global scenarios. So some uh, organizations use um, our uh, country level estimates to think about their global portfolios. Um, so which countries are going to be most um, impacted over the, over the, coming, uh, over the coming decade um, in by, by climate policy, climate change. Um, etc. How does that impact their portfolio choice? Um, the other way um, that um, some institutions, so um, I take the example of the Bank of England, um, it uses our um, macro level projections um, from the, the climate scenarios. Um, 
And so Dan scales that um, to look at these different sector implications. So they had an idea how, of how different uh, sectors across the economy are likely to be impacted. And then from there, they can they actually have, are working on methodologies to go deeper than that to to the firm level, yeah. so that they can then um, um, you know, work with 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 uh, with firms as part of their supervisory role um, in in thinking about how they can um, they can comply with with what they need to do um, in order to assess their their sort of climate sensitivity. So that those are the sort of two main yeah. main ways that I think people are using them. Yeah, and. If you if you if you look at your models, how often do you update your models? Oh, very good question. All the time, yeah. all the time, and not very often. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, a, so a model model is never a finished product. No. So we're always evolving. You know, Nigem, our our macro model has been evolving for thirty years. Um, uh, so it's always sort of being developed. Um, but core parts of it, we don't modify, so it's not one of these types of models that we re-estimate, you know, every month or every, every quarter, um, uh, because, uh, you know, the world doesn't change just because we have one new point of data. We want um, to have some sort of baseline which we can um, assess new developments against um, that's consistent with the same way we were assessing yeah. it a month ago yeah. or a year ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question from the floor is also to you is, um, the inflation and GDP numbers that you put up earlier, the impact is different by country. Mm. Why? Um, okay, so I guess there's four uh, reasons, four key reasons from a sort of modeling perspective is why um, uh, different countries are impacted different ways from, you know, we're import, imposing the same shocks in all countries. So it was a flat, yeah. which may be sort of implausible type of scenario, but just you know, for the scenario's sake, a flat carbon tax at the same rate in all countries. Um, so the energy intensity of production in, uh, per country matters. The carbon intensity, so that's the energy mix, um, also matters. Um, and the uh, the policy reaction in the country. So do they are they a very uh, flexible economy? Is their exchange rate likely to go up, up, down? Um, uh, are interest rates very um, very mobile? Are they likely to react? And is the government likely to um, uh, respond with you know, sort of Fiscal stimulus or yeah. set or or not, um, and then the the um, that was three. So the fourth one, oh yeah, is whether or not they're um, an exporter or importer of fossil fuels makes a huge difference in terms of the terms of trade impacts of uh, declining demand for yeah. fossil fuels. Could, could countries start to think about carbon as a currency? Um, I think that's. I mean, it's it's a dangerous. <laughs> you know, carbon policy is it's designed to sort of. Um, uh, to sort of work its way um, to zero in the end, right? We're, we're aiming for net zero. Yeah. That means um, uh, the, uh, of course, this is a long-term transition and, um, and there's also the sort of carbon sequestration and capture technologies, which could you know, um, continue to capture uh, revenue in the future. Yeah. Um, but in terms of- um, So carbon credits in the currency, if you like. Like uh, almost like a digital or token, tokenized currency. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting concept. For another time. Thanks. For another time. Um, Dan, a question for you: How well prepared are tax authorities for new carbon for the new carbon taxes that are going to come? Um, <clears throat> I think it's it's a, it's a very mixed bag. I mean, there's, there's three things that I'm I, I probably focused on. Firstly, you know the tax authorities in jurisdictions that have got more well advanced and established reporting and regulations requirements will probably be better better set if they if they decide to to introduce carbon taxes you know so some of the stuff that philip talked about jurisdictions that are more sophisticated around that area the tax authorities will be able to rely and set a tax based on financial information that's reported in groups accounts but but lots of countries lots of countries are much further behind that that curve so so how are they going to get that information and test it the second thing I'd look at is actually policy shifts. So certain policy shifts, you know, um, like I talked about competition, you know, COP26 is going to accelerate some things. You know, governments have got very set policies in a lot of places, but um, that could change very quickly. You know, the UK is very focused on initially emissions trading, climate change levy, cost of business. 
then move into a kind of supporting switch and innovate and then moving into demand led changes. So actually focusing on consumers, that's the five year plan. Who knows what's going to happen particularly? And then would the UK authorities be ready to switch quickly if, if there was a decision to go down a more holistic carbon tax? And then the last thing I'd look at is, is, is it a holistic question? Are governments and tax authorities looking at this all holistically and you know you can't the law of unintended consequences says you can't predict everything but are they trying to think through the different implications of different things they do you know I, I came down to London a few weeks ago for the first time in a couple of years and, and actually looking out of the train window I got a huge shock on the extra the amount of solar panels in in fields and I, and I know planning allows you to put it next to train station train lines and all that but it, it kind of shocked me and I was just thinking you know, if, if there's tax policy around encouraging, you know, incentives and things for farmers to switch, you know, and then lots and lots of individual farmers do that, how's that affect our food security? You know, and it's, it's that kind of thing. It's really hard to pull, to do that. And, and, and the tax authorities and the governments that will succeed are the ones that try their best to think about all those, those different impacts. And finally, I'm just on holistic thinking. What are they using the money for that they're raising from carbon tax is going to be interesting. So, you know, lots of governments have got massive holes at the moment actually you know to dawn's presentation if carbon tax revenue and carbon trading revenue was plowed back into helping companies and, and individual homeowners switch to cleaner technologies that would have a much bigger impact but actually there's lots of different calls on on the um, on, on tax revenues raised but that's that's quite a long answer but hopefully hopefully it gives you a bit of a flavor on that. Yeah. Good. And there was a follow-on question uh, as well that said, you know, do you expect these um, taxes to be direct or indirect, consumer or producer? It's going to, it's going to, it's going to vary, vary a lot. I mean, but if you think about, you know, it's always politicians making these decisions. Ultimately, it's not, it's not us, it's not us for, it's not, it's not civil servants who, who, who try and think about it. You know, who only think about it objectively, is politicians. And that, you know, in, in the current environment. You know, there's, there's, there's reports that I mentioned this week about a gas levy on, on domestic use. I mean, that might be an attractive thing, but for, for, for the agenda that we've been talking about, but in the political environment at the moment, can you do that in the UK? Could, you know, will the government do that? Have you given the, all the, the energy price stuff? You know, probably not. Um, it's easier politically to put stuff onto business. I think that's, all, that's just always been the case. Um, so, you know, I'd expect more effort around business but i think i think um on consumers i think it, it probably has a bigger effect if you've got the i won't use a <laughs> if you've got the will to uh, to do it and, and, you, and you see that but I'm, I'm not convinced all governments do yeah uh question for you phil um offsetting is it an opportunity or a threat for companies well, I mean, it, it, it's an opportunity for people who can provide um, uh, legitimate offsets. I, you know, it's a business opportunity for some people who can do that, and it's certainly an opportunity. I mean, we we are very when we when we talk about offsets, there are all these different levels of them. We very much encourage um, companies to invest in removal offsets, so that they are um, investing in a project that will allow a permanent removal of carbon from the atmosphere. Now, of course, we all know that the technology behind a lot of these things is still difficult and very expensive, um, or still not even invented. Yeah. Yes, um, but I think if if there is obviously you know the carbon price starts going up and it makes those um, versions of offsets more attractive to invest into, then I think it's definitely an opportunity. Yeah. Um, there are these, as I mentioned, you know, there are some cheaper offsets out there where there are lots of question marks about the permanence and there's sometimes double counting at play and that's I guess where as a company and if you are paying money for those you need to be very careful because I suspect um, there is going to be greater um, regulation around this I mean I, I, there's so many acronyms floating around but what was the um you've used a few to that yeah I've used a few I do apologize for that yeah what's the TSVCM the task force on scaling voluntary carbon market yeah the, and the VCS voluntary concept. It's good that all these organizations are slowly getting more teeth and getting more credibility to make sure that companies who are doing this in the best possible you know, um, faith actually get what they're paying for. But um, certainly when I book a flight here and I'm sort of told what it costs to offset my carbon, I don't believe that that's the right price. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenging question, isn't it? Mm. Actually, it's um, and, and there's clearly some reticence 
on the part of some people who are generating offsets to sell them because they may themselves need to use them. I think in agriculture in particular, although it was an area of interest of mine, uh, you know, farmers and large scale producers are, are being encouraged to sell their, um, their carbon um, right. offsets to any number of different industries like shipping, mm. aerospace, et cetera, uh, which, is, um, which is interesting. Um, sadly, I have not got time to ask all these questions that we've received, um, but maybe I'll do that uh, later when we're, uh, when we're together uh, again. I want to thank um, Phil, Dawn, Dan uh, for joining us today. Thank you all uh, for dialing in. We've really enjoyed our first virtual uh, event together, uh, which has been nice to, uh, to, to see people um, in the flesh. Um, I certainly hope that you found this uh, interesting, some food for thought. Um, clearly, um, GT is available to help you uh, in, in all of these areas, um, as discussed. Um, we're going to put out some information on, uh, on future events um, as well that you'll see across the ESG uh, products um, at, uh, at GT. But in the meantime, uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, and we will uh, we'll see you all again very soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks, all. Goodbye.